and it's in Acts chapter 17, and this is of the church in Berea in Acts chapter 17, and we'll read verses 10 through 15. Acts chapter 10, verses uh, 17, verses 10 and through 15. And we also, we often hear the term, be a Berean. And this is, this comes from this passage. So it's amazing how these passages have certain scriptures that have had such powerful influence. Last time when we were in Thessalonica, we looked at how they said of Paul, he who has turned the world upside down. A very memorable statement. And here the memorable statement is of these Bereans. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. I mean, it's a powerful statement that has truly had an incredible amount of influence. That one little statement, right? Has an incredible amount of influence on, on the church through the centuries. So, Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. Now remember, Paul is in Macedonia. The call was for him to go to Macedonia. He went to the chief city, Philippi. He went to the largest and probably the capital of that region, Thessalonica. And now he goes to the third major city of Macedonia. He's still in Macedonia, Berea, who coming thither went unto the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. What a great statement. When people search the scripture to see whether it's true or not, many will believe. Also, the honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, that is the Gentiles, not a few. That is a lot. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Let's pray. So now, Lord, take this time and challenge us and encourage us with the word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the, the challenge is, do you know what you believe and why? Can you articulate your faith, and can you show somebody from the Bible what you believe about certain doctrines that are essential to our faith. So the Bereans challenge us. They were not even believers in Christ at this point, but yet they readily listen to what Paul says, and then they search out for themselves whether what Paul was saying was true or not. Now, in previous cities, the Jewish people did not give Paul even that favor. They often just ran him out and persecuted him. But that's why it says they were more noble-minded than the other Jewish people who antagonized and would drive Paul away from them. Isn't it amazing that as Paul escapes from Thessalonica, maybe, maybe he would have thought to himself, you know, I've been going to the synagogues when I go into these cities. That would be, that's my first place. And th that's like not working out so great for me. I mean, the, the Jewish people are getting all stirred up. They're antagonizing me. They're persecuting me. I was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. I was, I, I was beaten up in Philippi and thrown into prison. Maybe I'll go to the pagan temple to start out here. <laughs> but he doesn't. It says the first place he goes in Berea, it says he went to the synagogue of the Jews. Why does he do that? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to who? To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the gospel was going to go to the Jewish people first, even in the first century. And then it was as it went to the Jew, it went to the Greek. Because many Greeks, many Gentiles, believe when, because those God-fearing Gentiles are in the synagogues. So, 
you could say on the one hand that Paul going to the synagogues was stirring things up. And so, Paul, maybe you should change your methodology? No. On the other hand, why were they getting so stirred up? Because Paul was being so successful. Because great multitudes were believing as they had even in Thessalonica. And we looked at that where a great multitude believed. And here it says, not a few of men and women were turning to the Lord. So Paul's, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul's gospel was having tremendous effect. One of the chief motives that the Jewish people had, if you go back to Acts 13 and verse 45, why, what was motivating them to antagonize and persecute Paul? What was it? Acts 13, 45. Who's got that verse and can read Acts 13, verse 45? Do you have it, Douglas? Okay. Acts 13, 45. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. Okay, so they were filled with envy because so many were following. And remember, when Jesus spoke, the people said, he speaks with authority, not like the scribe. Same with Paul. He spoke with authority. Now look in Acts chapter 17, verse 5 also, when we see a repetition of this thought. Acts 17, verse 5. And who can read that verse for us when Paul was in Thessalonica? Who's got that? Brother Tim, you got it? Yes. Acts 17, 5. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Okay, so again we see that idea of, of envy. And so what I want to do tonight, and I, I hope this isn't going to be too much of a disaster, but I want to show you, it, it, as a review, some of you already know how to use Blue Letter Bible, but I get a blessing from studying the different words, and so if... And we're here to study the Bible, so I want to kind of just show, go to Blue Letter Bible because this is an app available for free. You don't have to pay $1,000 for this software. I want to show you, though, how it's so simple to use and it could be a blessing. So what you do when you go to Blue Letter Bible, you type in Blue Letter Bible, and then you just put the verse in the top. So I'm going to look at the, and I want to compare the words envy I thought about the, I was wondering if the word envy in Acts 13.45 was the same as the word in Acts 17.5. And I want to see what does that word actually mean, you know, as well. And how else is it used in the Bible? So you just, I'm, I'm already in Acts 13, but I'm going to just put it in here just so you see. All you do is you just type it in the, the search engine and it'll bring you right there. It'll bring you right to Acts, Acts uh, chapter 13. Oh, yeah, let me hit that arrow there. And it'll bring us right down to verse 45. So then what you do is, you see where it says tools. You hit tools, and all, here's all the things that you can do now when you come. You can, you can compare the different Bible translations on how they translate that verse. It has cross-references, commentaries. You can listen to J. Vernon McGee. Also, there's, there's uh, written commentaries as well as, as uh, audio messages. Dictionary. So there's like, you could spend a lot of time here, but I often, my, my default is to go to the interlinear, and I like to look at this Greek a little bit. Now, you could teach yourself Greek pretty easily, and again, I don't want to go too fast here, but just to show you, if, let's say, you want to find out the tense of a particular word, or the what kind of a, a grammar, what, what point of grammar it is, you just have to, all you have to do is click on it. So this is the word for the Jew. And so it tells you it's the word, the English word is Jews over here. Do you see where it says Jews? And it tells you it's an adjective. So it tells you whether it's a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, that kind of thing, okay? So all you have to do is click on the, on the word and it will parse, that's called parsing. It's called parsing the word. And it will parse the verbs, which is also very helpful. 
So it's very difficult to learn Greek to the point where you could look at a Greek verb and know all the points of grammar in every Greek verb because every Greek verb has uh, a tense, it's either past, present, future, a voice, it's either an active voice or a passive voice or a mood. It's either like a command or it's an actual real action or whatever. So tense void mood is in every Greek verb. And so let me just show you this. Here is a verb. They were filled. And you see where it says it's a verb? That's, that's where you know it's a, a verb. If you see the. So that N is now. Now this is a verb. And then after a while, you'll learn the parsing a code that they use because the A stands for aorist. So it's a verb, it's an aorist, it's a passive, and it's indicative. You, you might say, well, I don't know what aorist means, but all you have to do is click aorist and it'll tell you a definition. So you can actually learn a little Greek grammar here. In other words, read the Bible, but then study the Bible and then try to build on your ability to study the Bible. So you can learn some basic Greek right here through the Blue Letter Bible. It's a really incredible tool. So basically, Aris, don't be afraid of that term. It just means it's a simple past tense. And it's the most commonly used past tense in the, uh, in the, in the Greek language. Okay, so, so I wanted to look at this word in Acts 13, verse 45. And it's the word envy. So you see on the one side, uh, they were filled. You see on the one side, here's the English. This is the Strong's Concordance number that it's keyed with. This is the Greek word, and this is the parsing of that word, okay? So even, so here's the Greek word, but this is how it sounds out. It looks like zelos, zelos, okay? But if you say, well, how do you actually say that? You could just hit that button. Strong's G2205, zelos. So he'll, he'll zelos. tell you the word. You can learn how to say the Greek words. Am I boring you? Is this okay how I'm doing this? Okay. So now, watch this. So what you do is you can, if you hit 2205, it'll bring you to this Greek word now. And now it's going to tell you how this word is used in the Bible. Now, here are these Jewish people. They're filled with envy. Is that good or bad? Do you want this kind of, of spirit in your life? No, we don't want envy that persecutes the people of God. But now you're going to look at how this word is used. And the first verse that comes up, how is this verse used? John chapter 2, verse 17. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Well, who had that zeal? Jesus. <laughs> That's the first time it comes up. Now, so this word is actually used in positive ways and negative ways. In other words, we all have this emotion and we have to channel it the right way. It's either going to be channeled for wrong or it's going to be channeled for good. So it's very interesting when you compare how these words are. So here's the, here's the biblical usage. It means excitement of mind, ardor, fervent, fervor of spirit, zeal. Uh, and anyway, it's a definition. It also tells you here, uh, let's see, how many times it's used. I always like to know how many times it's used. So it's used 17 times in the New Testament. And this actually, this point of speech, it's a noun. It's a neuter noun. Okay? Now, it also tells you the etymology. And I like to click that because, look, if you go back to the etymology, and this is the root word, and the root word only appears two times, I don't usually tell you all this stuff when I preach, but I like uh, this, I, I know this as background, okay? So it appears two times, and look what the word means. It means to boil with heat and be hot. So just apply it to Jesus. What did Jesus have a boiling passion for? The house of God. In, the, in that, that, that context, the temple. But for us, the house of God is the church. So we need to have this boiling passion, a zeal for the church and for God's glory in the church. But the Jews channeled their zeal against. They, they had a zeal for the Mosaic law and anything that came against the Mosaic law, they would defend the Mosaic law and fight against anyone. Okay, so 
So this is just one word. Now, if you now go to Acts 17, 5, so remember now, this is a point, the point of speech is a verb here. Go to Acts 17, uh, uh, 5, and I think what's kind of interesting here now, when you go to this, and you hit the tools again, and you go to this interlinear once again, and I'm just going to go straight to, to the uh, word zel, zel oh, it's a different word. Remember the other one was zelos? So this is zel, oh, how do you say that? Hmm, I don't know. Let's go with this. Strong's G2206, zelao. Oh, zelao. Zelao. Okay, zelao. I'm Players learning my Greek here today. Lexicon, related entry. Okay. Ze okay, we can, we can turn you off now. Okay, now. So, now, the other one was a noun, but this is a verb. So this is a verb, and it means to burn with zeal, to be heated, to boil with envy, and so forth. Now, um, and, and now this one is, if you hit the etymology, it's from zelos, which is the word we just looked at, and then it will bring you back to the, the other root word. So, so it's a different point of speech, it's a verb, and it, the other one is a noun. Both are used positively as well like if you if you were to look at at this word and it's used only 12 times now some words you're going to hit some words and they're used like 200 times so it's hard to to digest all of that but you could digest 12 times right so it's oh so how is this word used in the new testament you go down it's used how the patriarchs were moved with envy against joseph it's used here in this passage but now it's used in 1 Corinthians 12. Covet earnestly the best gifts. Is that good or bad? That's good. In other words, we should have a zeal for, to use and exercise and know our spiritual gifts so we can serve God in the church. And the church is involved again. Oh, what do you know? That we should have a zeal for the house of God, for the glory of God in the church, and to use my gifts in the church. And so... He's saying, you know, and that's how the word is used. And it's used for jealousy. And now I like how it's used in, look at Galatians chapter 4, in verse 17. Paul uses it in both ways here. He says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. So the word affect is this word. In other words, they they have a zeal for you, but it's not a, it's, it's not with a pure motive. They, they will actually want to exclude you from what they're doing, that, that, you might, that you might have a zeal for them. He's talking about these false teachers, the Judaizers. But anyway, look at verse 18. He says, it is good to be zealously affected always in a what? Good thing. Not only when I'm present with you, because you could be zealously affected for a bad thing or a good thing. The Jews had a zeal for the wrong things. Jesus had a zeal for the right things. May God help us to have zeal. Okay. Do you know what the Jewish people teach us about this passage? In a way, they, it, it kind of just hits me this way, that it just shows that it's hard to change in life. Because think of what the Jewish people, think if you were a Jew in the first century now, and here comes somebody in the town, and he's preaching Jesus is the Messiah, and you don't have to be circumcised anymore. Well, they had been doing circumcision for 2,000 years, since Abraham. And now, you, don't, you can worship God on the first day of the week. You don't have to keep the Sabbath day anymore. Oh, and you don't have to keep all those dietary laws. Oh, and by the way, Jesus Christ is the finished sacrifice. You don't have to offer all those sacrifices and keep the Jewish feasts. And they're like, what? They were going to defend all of that. And so they were angry at Paul because they were reacting against earth-shattering change. It's not easy to change. But the, these were more noble-minded. And notice just three quick things here. My time's almost gone. Wow, I spent a lot of time doing that. Maybe we'll do it next time, it was kind of fun. I thought it was, I, I enjoyed that, I, I, I like doing that. So a wholehearted reception of the word. I actually have two, two more to do, but we're not gonna have time for it. A wholehearted reception, it says, with all readiness of mind. It says in Acts 17, verse 11, 
these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word. They received the word. What, what is the word? The word of God. Because it even says down in the text, in verse 13, that the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul. They, they knew what he was preaching. The word of God. They didn't like his interpretation, but he was preaching the word of God. But they had a wholehearted reception. It says with readiness of mind. Okay, here I go again. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it. Look at this, and we won't, this won't be as long. I'm just going to look up one word, and it's in Acts chapter 17. And I want you to get used to doing this because welcome to my world, as they say. Okay? It's fun. I have a great time. Are you kidding me? I get to study the Bible and then tell you what I, what I find in the Bible. What a great life. Okay. It says, these were more noble-minded. Okay, I'm going to go hit my tools again. And I'm going to go right to this word readiness. Okay, this will be the last one we said. They received the word. There's a lot of words we could look at here. But I like this word re readiness. Now, what's that word? You see what it says there? It says prothumia. So that's, a co that's what you call a compound word. Pro is the preposition. And then thumos. So now I want to do this first because this is so interesting to me. Here's the word in the etymology. It's because this is a noun and it's the etymology is to this adjective, very similar word. But in, then it says it's from these two words. So this word readiness now, this word readiness, the root word is thumos. And if you click that, the word thumos is translated 15 times, it's used 18 times in the New Testament, thumos is used 18 times, and it's translated wrath 15 times, fierceness and indignation, thumos, wrath. Now, is that good or bad? Do we want to be people of wrath and anger and indignation? No, but again, but what's the word that we're looking at? It's pro, thumos. <laughs> pro means what? <laughs> More good I'm for and actually so the word is used here with a readiness of mind in other words they had a passion so you cannot take the passion away from their mind when they receive the word of God so that's why it's good to look up these words because they didn't just like sit there and say oh this is kind of boring Paul when are you going to be done you know preaching all night again you yeah. <laughs> No, they had a passion for the word of God. Their hearts were stirred. By the way, thumos, we get our word thermos from that. We get our word thermostat from that. You know, it deals with heat. And so here they had an emotion and a passion and an affection. The Geneva Bible translated this ready, ready affection. Tyndale translated, translated diligence of mind. Our King James translates it beautifully, readiness of mind. So they had a ready mind, a wholehearted reception to hear the word of God. So the, the bottom line is they weren't swayed or influenced by the popular Jew, Jewish interpretations that was driving all the other places where Paul went. Isn't that amazing? Where the other Jewish people, as soon as they heard what Paul was saying, trying to change their whole culture and life, they were ready to drive Paul out. But they had a ready mind. Okay, the next thing, quick. They had, okay, so there's that word, prothumia, readiness of mind. Our, our mind ought to be passionately stirred for a good thing. But they had an unbiased evaluation of the word. And here's the word, they searched the scriptures daily. They searched the scriptures daily. What's the principle there? If the only spiritual food you get is when you come to church and hear even a sermon... From me, you're going to be spiritually poor. You need to study the Bible and search the scriptures daily. That's what it says. Now that word search, I, I got to do it. I'm the last one, okay? Now watch this. This is good. You know what that word means? You're going to find out. 
Acts 17, 11. Okay, here we go. Searched the scriptures. Do you have any idea what the root of that word is? Does anybody know? What the root? Do you know? What is it? What is it? Oh, oh, okay, yeah, right, good job, Charlie. You see, Charlie's on top of it. So here's, here's the word. It's anacrino. Now, it, it tells you it's a verb, but I'm just going to go straight, straight to the word itself because, and look at the etymology of this word. It's, again, a compound word. The preposition is ana. And you know what ana means? It has the idea of, of get right into the midst of something. Get into the midst of something. And then, crino is used 114 times in the Bible, and 88 times it's translated what? See this? 88 times it's translated judge. So to search the scriptures daily has the idea of get into the middle of the Bible, and don't be a judge of the Bible, but like a judge, examine the scripture to get to the truth. Is the point now watch how this word is used as well and it means it, it gets to that very that very point okay so we, we're back to anacrino and now this word is only used 16 times in the new testament not many times so it's easy to do a word study with a word like this searched the scriptures so the idea here now watch this it's used in acts 12 where in Acts 12, 19, what does it say? And Herod sought for him, found him not. He examined the keepers. He searched out the keepers. What, what did he want to find? What did he want to find out? P Peter had escaped from, from prison. And so he examined the, the prison guards. He wants to find out what exactly happened. How did Peter get out of prison? He wants to know what? The truth. Of what happened so that's the point of searching the scriptures it's to get into the Word of God and just as a judge in a courtroom wants the truth to come out in the courtroom so there could be proper adjudication of right and wrong so we must know the scripture search the scripture so your life could be lived in a right path and avoid the wrong so that you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's the word. Search the scripture. Now, we could look up the word scripture. We don't have the time for that. We could look up how they did it daily, and how they read the word of God, and searched it, and studied it out. But it was an unbiased, that's why I put unbiased evaluation of the word. They searched the scripture daily. Now, one last point about this word. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And here's how the word is used. It's, it's often translated judged and examined, but it's used here in the context of the Bible itself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. And it says here, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually Anacrino, that's that word, discerned. In other words, you have to have a spiritual mind. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You actually, what Paul is saying here, we must have the Holy Spirit if we're going to make a proper judgment of the Word of God so that we can apply it and understand it to our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us. Verse 15, he that is spiritual, there's the word, anacrino, judges all things. He will get, he that is spiritual will put his heart right into the midst of scripture. Search out the scripture to find the truth of God's word. That's what he's saying. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. The idea is if, if you're letting the scripture judge your life and you're living according to the scripture, no man could uh, make a judgment of you. And if they do, it doesn't matter because God is our judge. So lastly, so here in this passage, we see they had a wholehearted reception for the word. 
They had an unbiased evaluation, and then just very quickly, there was a humble verification to see whether those things were so. They did not want to take another's word for the word of God. They wanted to know themselves. So I ask you, have you personally examined the scripture so that you know what you believe and why? And here's what I'm talking about. Do you know what you believe and why? Can you give a reason of the hope that lies within you? Could you show somebody from the Bible why you believe God is tri a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Could you show somebody from the Bible? Could you show somebody from the Bible why do you believe Jesus is God? You have verses for that. Do you know why he's, he's fully man? Do you know why the Holy Spirit is God? Do you know why the scripture is God's authority and the inspired word? Do you know why Jesus is the only way to heaven? That's an offense to the world. But if somebody say, you mean to tell me that all the Muslims in the world are dying and going to hell if they don't believe the way you believe? You know, that's the way the world phrases it. What about hell? Do you believe in hell? Do you understand why we believe in hell? Do you know what sin is and where it came from? Do you know what the rapture is? The second coming? Do you know what the Bema Seat Judgment is? And what's the difference between the Bema Seat Judgment and the Great White Throne Judgment? <laughs> what's the judgment of the nations? What's the believer's personal judgment? What are the New Testament offices of the local church? Do you know what scripture teaches about church membership? Do we keep the Sabbath day? I have those scriptures there. We won't look it up. But search the scriptures for yourself. Now, don't deconstruct the Bible. But let the Bible build up your life as you study the word. And so as we go back to our text, let me just say the three points and emphasize this, that these Bereans had a wholehearted reception for the word. Really, as it, and, and initially they weren't even believers yet. But they searched the scriptures with a wholehearted reception, with an unbiased evaluation, with a humble verification, and the result of that kind of heart and spirit, it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 13, that when the, um, oh, verse 12, I'm sorry, therefore many of them believe, therefore many of them believe. And I believe as we search the scriptures, we'll strengthen our faith. Let's pray.